different. Uh, I used to say be gritty, but after we changed our, our spacecraft's name, resilience, I've started to use that term resilience, which means to not just get through the tough times in your life, but to grow through them, to get better through them. And then the last one is to be a good teammate. Be good to the people that you work with, be good to people uh, that you don't even work with. And then, uh, you know, space flight is one example of amazing things that human beings are capable of when we not just put aside our differences, but when we bring our differences together as strengths and work on a common goal, a common mission, we're able to, to get people into space and more importantly, home back to their families safely. Uh, and so I love that example of what we can do together. And so with that, I'm gonna stop, be resilient, be a lifelong learner and be a good teammate. And I would love to tell you some more stories. I just don't have time before I run this morning, but I would love to answer a couple of questions uh, before I get out of here. Thanks so much, Victor. Uh, any quick questions for, uh... For Victor Glover, I have to be good to him because he's sort of my boss right now. <laughs> the way our structure is. <laughs> see, we, I know see who the, we know who the real boss is. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a question um, in the chat. How long does it take to get to space? That's a great question. And um, so, you know, we define space as uh, 62 miles, 100 kilometers off the ground, and it's actually quite surprising. You know, that rocket, a lot of the energy in, in, a, in a rocket, the booster, is to get you through the, the gravity well and the friction of the air. And so it actually, you get to space in, in about three or four minutes. Uh, so we hit that, that Carmen line is the name of that 100 kilometer or 62 mile point. And if you watched uh, the Crew-1 launch, You'll see Shannon and I fist bump. We will, you know, bump fists with each other. She was sitting right next to me to my right, right when we hit 100 kilometers, because it's a great sign. It's a significant point. You reach space. But yeah, you get there in about, you know, three to four minutes. But uh, it then took us another 27 hours to actually catch the space station and get to our home in space. But actually getting to space, the beginning of space, 100 kilometers uh, was just minutes. It was just a few minute trip. Great question. Okay, so that we don't get in trouble with your schedulers. You got to go, man. <laughs> okay, I wish I could stay on longer. I am, I'm going to run, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the event. Mike, thank you, sir, and you have the controls. All right, I got the controls. Have a good run. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I see a, a bunch of students just arrived, and it looks like they're all settled, and Moenya, I uh, see a bunch of students just arrived, and um, of course, uh, Victor had to run, and uh, is everybody settled there, and do you want me to get started? Hi, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Victor has already gone. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that presentation, Victor, and thank you so much for having Victor join us. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So uh, the students that are joining us right now are from Jacaranda Combined School. And of course, uh, because I met you over an event like this in 2015, June, so I'd like uh, to, uh, for them to hear you speak of course, which is important um, that their minds know that um, all these things are possible, like for someone to be an astronaut. So I'll just like let you speak and share your journey. I'm not going to spoil it and like <laughs> introduce you on their behalf. So yeah, you can go ahead and introduce yourself for uh, the ones that are just joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. It's so good to hear your voice, Moenya. And uh, I've really enjoyed watching the, um, uh, formation of the Paidea project and, and all the great things you guys are doing down there. And uh, I will uh, just mention very quickly before I start showing a few pictures that um, we have many different types of people in the astronaut office. So Victor uh, was a, a Navy fighter pilot. He, he's really amazing. I, I, I say that not just because he's my boss right now, but he's been a very good friend for many, many years now uh, since uh, 2013 or so. And um, he uh, is uh, kind of, it shows you how diverse we are. I'm a medical doctor. We have geologists, we have engineers, we have biologists. It's a little bit of everybody, uh, men, women, all, all flavors of life that come together 
to kind of share this this vision and to share the work that we do in spaceflight. And uh, so I, I'm very privileged to be a part of that world. And, and that's uh, what I'd like to talk about a little bit today. And um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and hopefully works out. There we go. And then uh, I'll show some pictures to everybody now. Um, when you just to be sure, can you see a, a, a cover slide that says flying in space? Yes, I can. I can. All right, brilliant. Okay. Um, so I uh, this is flying in space. Um, I uh, I really love what I do, and I'm going to try to give you a very quick glimpse of it. But I want to leave a lot of time. Uh, for people to uh, ask questions. And I always learn from, from students when we do this. Uh, but, uh, while Victor was talking, I did very quickly put some pictures in here. This is the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. It's a great big pool. And this is where Victor is, is going right now uh, to practice spacewalks. And it's um, a little hard to tell, but inside that pool is a, a model or a mock-up of the space station. And so we will put on a spacesuit and we'll work inside there just like we would work in space. And it gives us a chance to practice um, before we actually fly in space and do a spacewalk. So here you can see somebody uh, getting ready to dip. He's got this really big heavy suit on and together with the suit and the person, it's maybe 500 pounds, 220 kilos or so. Uh, and so you're very, very heavy if you're on land, like you can't move when you're in that thing. Um, once you get in the water, it's almost like being in space. It's uh, you're you don't uh, rise, you don't sink, and you practice moving all that mass around. And we get ready to do that before we fly in space. So it's one of the funnest things we do. It's one of the hardest things we do. Uh, Victor's a really strong guy, and he really rocks at this. And we always go two at a time. Uh, but but that's what he's going off to do. So I'm really, really happy that, that I was a little bit surprised, admittedly, that he was able to join us this morning because uh, I knew he had a really busy day. Um, but anyway, really quickly, um, if there's any question about where you are, this is what Lusaka looks like from space. And um, this is from our good friends at the European Space Agency. But this is what we see when we look down at the Earth. And you can see it's it's a little bit of a, a white um, spot up there where Lusaka is. It's it's unmistakable, uh, but sometimes it's hard to pick out during the daytime. You can always pick it out at night because the lights of Lusaka just light up the surrounding countryside. It's, it's really quite beautiful. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit more about uh, Lusaka as we get a little bit further on. I like people to remember that we are always going to and coming back from space since the year 2000. And I know that there's many people gathered in the room or in the chat room that weren't even born at a time that we didn't have people in space continually. So since the International Space Station came online in, in October of 2000, it's been permanently crewed with men and women from many, many different countries. And sometimes we forget about that. Uh, we take that for granted, which I think is a good thing because we've made it that uh, routine and that common. That is our expectation. And this is what the International Space Station looks like. And I actually took this picture from my shuttle mission. And um, it, it was kind of a special time because we had a bunch of different cargo vehicles up there and it made the station even bigger. And then when we docked our space uh, shuttle to it, uh, we became a really big volume. So the station is actually quite large uh, and uh, you can see it there orbiting the earth. It's just an absolutely beautiful place to, to look at the earth from. And uh, this is the latest crew that launched uh, just about three months ago. Uh, what we call crew four, Victor Glover was on crew one of the uh, Space uh, X Dragon, the SpaceX Dragon capsule. Uh, but this is very typical of our crews. We have men and women. This is a, a multinational crew. Samantha Cristoforetti on the right there is from Italy. Uh, and then we have uh, Jessica Watkins on the left, who's a geologist. Uh, Bob Hines, who's a pilot. And uh, the tall guy there, Chell Lingard, who's also a medical doctor um, and was the commander of that uh, spacecraft. And I will point out that uh, as a medical doctor, he commanded that spacecraft and they docked 
to a space station that was also commanded by a medical doctor, uh, Dr. Tom Marshburn. Um, and it was really quite interesting. And nobody mentioned a word about it. Uh, to me, it was very special, but uh, it, the, the fact is it was just coincidence. It wasn't anything that we set up. It's just who we are. We're, we're a bunch of different backgrounds uh, and we come together and, and do some of these amazing things, which I think is, is great. And so this shows you the people that are on board the International Space Station right now. So they go, went up as a group of four and they joined three others that are up there already. And uh, this is our Russian crewmates who launched on a different vehicle, the Soyuz. So uh, that big station that I showed you, these are the seven people that are up there right now, uh, just doing lots of work. So just a reminder that we, we always have people up there, which is, is great. Now, uh, I think Mwenya had wanted me to talk a little bit about my path. Uh, I'll, I'll make that very brief, but uh, I, I know that uh, Lusaka is in the middle of a big farming area. I grew up on a farm also. This was our house and, uh, in Washington state. And we, uh, we raised beef cattle and sheep uh, and we worked in the morning. Then we went to school, we came back and worked and, and it, it seemed like a lot of work at the time. But um, uh, looking back on it, it was, it was a really good way to grow up because I learned how to fix things. Uh, things broke all the time and, and it was very good training for space station as it turned out. Uh, and I went to, now you have to do a little bit of math. So I went to elementary school, that was five years. Um, junior high and high school. And so I, I was 18 when I, I graduated high school. Then I went to four years of university at the University of Washington. And my degree was in marine zoology, uh, ocean life, life of the sea. Then I spent eight more years going to medical school and learning a medical specialty, which was internal medicine. And then yet another two years learning aerospace medicine. Um, which is totally different all the way. And at this time, I had already thought I wanted to work with the space program. Uh, and so when I finished all of that, uh, even my mother was calling me and asking me if I would ever get a real job. It was a lot of schooling. It was a lot of Um, a couple of things working at the Johnson Space Center, it's hard to believe, but over 30 years ago, uh, which is really quite remarkable. And uh, so this is the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, very close to where Victor and I both live. Uh, it, it's almost like a, a, a school, really. It looks like a college campus, and it often feels just like that as well. So even though I finished all my formal learning quite a while ago, I still am learning every day, uh, which is great. In fact, I spent a lot of yesterday um, learning from teachers, from instructors, and I'll do a lot of that as well today. So that very quickly is my path. Just to understand it was years and years, but I was really curious about what I wanted to do and, uh, and really loved it. So uh, that really helped. Um, a little bit about leaving the planet. So this is the planet Earth that you hopefully are all familiar with. Um, this was the day of my first launch. I'm there on the right. I, I had a Russian commander in the middle, Gennady Padalka, and on the left is somebody who actually paid a lot of money to fly with us as a, as a tourist, if you will, Charles Simonyi, who's uh, Hungarian-American. Uh, and so again, we were already a multinational crew, and I was the, the one who was making my first flight. Um, this is what the flight looks like. So uh, this is the Russian Soyuz rocket, at least the lower half of it, and it, it spins up on the pad there. The, the engines start to uh, come to full power, and it, it lifts off. It's a very gentle lift off, lift off and uh, it rises up, and this is launched from the country of Kazakhstan, uh, which is really quite a, a desolate place. It's in the middle of the desert, uh, but that's where you want to launch rockets so that when the, some of the stages burn out, they don't fall on people. Uh, or if there's any accident, but, but frankly, it's just a great place to launch a rocket. I'm not sure this is only showing the lower half of it. There you can see what the whole rocket looks like. It's actually very beautiful. And it's a very gentle launch when it leaves the pad. Uh, but here, we're starting to build speed. We're starting to build that velocity that'll uh, keep us in orbit. So we're starting to feel the G-forces. We're, we're feeling heavy. Uh, and uh, it's actually a very exhilarating feeling after years of preparation and learning and getting ready to go. 
And this is what it looks like, the picture of it, the Russian uh, Soyuz rocket. And uh, Victor mentioned that once you get to 100 kilometers, 62 miles, formally you're in space. Uh, but we take about eight minutes and 45 seconds to get a little bit higher into low Earth orbit. Uh, and then we can turn off our engines and we stay there. So we are trying to get from zero to 17,500 miles per hour. And that happens in about eight minutes and 45 seconds uh, with the Soyuz and the space shuttle. So that's what we call orbital velocity. So you, you need to be going that fast. Uh, and that means uh, we are, when we're going around the earth, it's, it's about that fast, 17,000 uh, miles per hour plus. So uh, when we're looking at the ground, you have to be pretty sharp and uh, wait for something you wanna see and be ready for it. Now, that was my launch on the um, Soyuz. This was getting ready to launch on the space shuttle. And uh, this was my crew. There were six of us because the space shuttle was quite a bit larger. And so we could carry six or seven people and a whole lot of stuff, cargo up to the space station as we did. And it was a great crew. Uh, five of these came from my class. So I got to fly with many of my classmates and uh, the commander there on the right, Steve Lindsay, who was the chief of the office and we retired him so that he could fly with us. Uh, and we had a great crew, it was a lot of fun. And again, just men, women, people from different backgrounds from everywhere. That's kind of who we are. This is what that space shuttle launch looked like. So here uh, you can see great big engines turning on, just roaring to life, and they fire for about five seconds. And then the big solids on the side, solid boosters light up, and off we go. And this one is not gentle at all. This was uh, very rough, very um, a lot of vibration, shaking, uh, but it, it was just a great launch. You can see how big this thing is launching from Florida in the United States. And this is where the booster burns out and separates. So the booster falls away and you can see us flying up into space. And the booster goes into the ocean and would be reused. And then we would go up to our orbit uh, where we wanted to get that orbital velocity again. So very much like the Soyuz, the, this is the last flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery. We had to get to about 17,500 miles an hour. So that's pretty fast. Um, and if you uh, do a little bit of math, the Earth is 25,000 miles around. So you go around the Earth every 90 minutes, uh, which is pretty quick. That means 16 times a day. And if you were looking at the shuttle coming to dock at the space station, it, it would look like this. Um, looking down, you saw this great big spaceship coming at you, and you knew that it was going to dock with you, and you were going to see your friends pretty quick. Um, but it was amazing to seeing those spaceships together. And uh, this is what the Russian Soyuz looked at. So like, so on my first flight, if you had looked from the space station as we were coming into dock, it would look like this. And the new spaceship that we're flying is the SpaceX Dragon. And that's what uh, Victor Glover flew actually as the first operational crew on this. So that was pretty exciting. It's a brand new spaceship. We've just been flying it for a couple of years now and we're really excited to have another way to get ourselves into space. And again, this is where we're going. This is our destination, the International Space Station. And I hope that uh, some of you have had a chance to watch this go over. There's, there's many ways to find out when the space station might be coming over in the evening or in the early morning, so you could actually see it. Uh, but uh, it's very bright. It's like a, a bright, fast moving star. And uh, I actually was able to see this from, from Zambia and your skies are clearer than ours. So we got great views of the space station from there. So uh, all of you should try to make an opportunity to see it. And this kind of shows you how, how big it is. So looking at a standard football pitch, um, we're, we're pretty long. We're actually longer than a football pitch. And you see those big flat sheets, our solar panels that give us our electricity. And then the modules, as we call them, the places where people live are more in the middle, but uh, it's, it's a pretty good size station. And what really changes for us when those engines stop and we dock with the station, we're in zero gravity. There's, there's no gravity that we sense and everything floats. And uh, I, I use the slide of my friend, Marsha Ivins to demonstrate that because you see her hair is everywhere. Um, and uh, it's an interesting sensation when you first get there because it, it almost feels like you're falling in every direction. And so uh, myself on the left, Charles Simone on the right, who launched with me, and in the middle, uh, looking much neater than either of us, is Koichi Wakata. 
Uh, and he had already been on the station for a few months, so he looked great. Um, and he was very adapted to space, but I'm holding on really tight because I, I feel like I'm out of control in zero gravity. It takes a while to get used to zero gravity. And, and this is what it looks like a few months in. So here I'm very comfortable. My hair is a mess, but um, that doesn't matter. I'm working pretty effectively every day and I'm floating right in the middle of the module and I don't care. I'm not worried that I'm not sitting in a chair or that my feet are not on the floor. I'm very happy in zero gravity and, and we become kind of zero gravity creatures, which I think is really interesting. And in a bit of a twist, normally on the ground, we walk with our legs and carry things with our arms. But here you can see I, I'm carrying things with my legs and I'll give myself a pull on that handrail and I'll, I'll start moving that way. But it's the reverse of what we would do on the ground. Up there, we kind of move with our arms and, and can easily carry things with our legs. So that's being in zero gravity and, and uh, the human just gets used to that really quickly. We don't really have an up or a down. So you can see my friend Christina Cook on the left and Drew Morgan on the right. And you could flip this picture upside down and um, then Drew would look upright, but it doesn't really matter to them. And it's sometimes interesting because when you're trying to talk to one another, you're used to seeing your faces pointed in the same direction. And when one's upside down uh, and the other seems to be more upright, it's a little bit harder to read the expressions of the face. So uh, we, we always find that amusing. If you make a really big wide smile, but you're upside down, it almost looks like you're unhappy. So uh, those are other things that you get used to. But mainly, uh, we're up there to do science. And um, this is, uh, as, as you saw, Victor Glover on the left and, and one of his crewmates, uh, Mike Hopkins on the right, and this was from their mission. And uh, what they're doing is science experiments. Uh, Victor is working on a, a biological science lab, and Mike Hopkins is actually harvesting plants that we're growing up there. You can see both of these guys are really strong. We, they're, they're two of the strongest guys that we have in the astronaut office, and it's just by coincidence, uh, they were commander and pilot of that mission. Uh, but the main point is that we, we do lots of science experiments. That's mainly why we're up there. And every day, you're doing new experiments and finding new things. And what I had mentioned, uh, Victor Glover had mentioned about being a lifelong learner, it, it all comes to sharp focus when you're on the station doing experiments and you're seeing new things for the first time every day, which is great. I will say another great thing is just uh, being with your crew. Uh, I had a great crew, both of my flights, and uh, this was from my first flight. And on that flight, by the way, I was up there for 199 days, six and a half months. It was a really long flight, but I loved every second of it. And uh, one of the things I loved most was just kind of being with my crewmates uh, around the table when we were eating together. Uh, you'll count more than six or seven people here because we had a visiting shuttle crew with us. Uh, but this is what it's like to eat in zero gravity. So every bit of your food has to be taped down or we use Velcro or something that keeps it from flying away. But it's just really fun to gather around the table. Another aspect of the station is that um, it is a dual language station. So this is my friend Kate Rubens and she's holding a book. And that book is a flight checklist because she's getting ready in this picture to land on the Russian Soyuz. But that, that book is in Russian. And so the, the station is bilingual. Everybody up there has to speak English and Russian. And it's hard enough for us, uh, both from the US or from, from Russia, but if you're Japanese, you still have to speak English and Russian. Or if you're European, if, you, if you're from Germany, you still have to speak English and Russian. So it helps us to come together because we have to learn one another's languages. Uh, it, it helps us to operate. It helps us to understand each other. Now, because we're in zero gravity, uh, our bones and our muscles don't feel the same load or the same weight as you would on the ground. And so we, we get weak. Uh, it's almost like if you were to lie in bed for weeks or months at a time, you would get weak also. Your bones and muscles really want to be loaded and stressed. So every day we exercise for two and a half hours. And uh, one of the ways we exercise, this is me doing a resistive exercise, uh, is we, we pull. It's almost like lifting weights, except nothing weighs anything. So uh, we have another way to put that force back into the machine that we have here. And these special machines 
give us a really good exercise. So here I'm just doing a deadlift uh, and it really helps. Uh, we, we do pretty good at, at keeping our bone and muscles strong. Uh, we also have bicycles. Um, this is my friend, Karen Nyberg, who's also got wild hair and zero gravity, um, but she's on a bicycle that's specially made for zero gravity. And you kind of have to hold on there because otherwise you'd, you'd fly off the bicycle. And then we have treadmills. Uh, and is, this is my friend, Sunny Williams, Sunita Williams, and she's running on the treadmill. But as you can see, she has um, straps and a harness which hold her down to the treadmill because there's no gravity. If she didn't have that, she'd just go flying off of it. Um, and Sunny is a really good runner. She actually ran a marathon up there, meaning she ran 26 miles on that treadmill, uh, which was really amazing. Um, it's, it's hard to do in zero gravity and, and uh, she's just amazing and she did it. Uh, one of the things that we all look forward to is doing a spacewalk, just like Victor is going to practice now in the pool. Uh, this was me on the left and, and my Russian commander on the right. Uh, we were out there doing, installing new antennas and fixing some things and pulling in some experiments. And uh, it's probably the thing that we all look forward to most once we get up there is, is going outside to do a spacewalk. Uh, that was two guys. This is two women uh, who were getting ready to do a spacewalk a couple of years ago, uh, Jessica Mir and Christina Cook. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're in the space station there on the left picture, getting ready to go. And those big things they have are, are drill drivers, by the way. They look like weapons, but they're not. Uh, but that's one of the main tools that we use. But um, they're, they're not very big until they put those suits on, Christina and Jessica. And you can see the suits on either side of them. And then on the right there, that's what it looked like when they were outside. So again, it's a, it's a small human inside uh, a combined about 500 pound stack. You almost like your own little spaceship, uh, but they were out there putting brand new, great big batteries. Each one weighed about 380 pounds uh, and putting those onto our power system. And they absolutely rocked it, did a great job. One of the things that um, you notice really quickly when you get up there is that there's no borders. When you're looking down at the earth, it's not a map. It is a planet, it's just beautiful, it's in its pristine state, and you can't really tell where one country ends or another one starts, uh, except for geographic boundaries, rivers or oceans or coastlines or mountain ranges. And it's, it's really an amazing thing to see the earth with, with no borders on it. And you realize, this, you know, we really are all one people. Uh, and the, the earth is just magnificent, always changing. Different parts of the earth are, are very different from one another. This is two different views of the earth just to show for comparison, but on the left, you see ocean and that's two thirds plus of the, the surface of the, the earth is ocean. And the right, you see uh, Western Africa, it's, it's desert. And you could watch the sand dune patterns change over the years and it's really quite, or over the uh, weeks and months, it's really quite amazing. And um, as I mentioned, Lusaka is easy to see at night. And this is actually Cairo at night. And you can see the lights of the city really tell you where people live. That's the footprint of humanity, as we call it. And that ribbon of light below it is the Nile River uh, and just lit up like crazy. And there you can see Israel on the right and the Mediterranean Sea just above those. And so uh, it's amazing. We, a lot of times we will wait to take pictures until it's nighttime because the view is so spectacular. Now, I'm gonna show you a little bit more of Lusaka from space, courtesy of my friends from ESA. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, narration on here. So I'm gonna step aside for just a second so you can hear that. And there's Africa and there's Zambia. And this is what we see. I'll let that run for just a moment.
Okay, I'm going to just go from there. But um, the, the point being, when we're looking from space, we it's a very powerful tool to see what's happening on the ground, what's changing, what's natural, what are people doing? And uh, one of the things that we really love looking at, especially in Africa and South America, is, is the agriculture, the crops, the circles, the fields. It's really uh, an amazing thing to watch. And um, the European Space Agency is very similar to our own NASA uh, from the US. And uh, we share in information all the time. And what they showed from that satellite view is very much exactly like what we see from space. So it's, it's really, really cool to share that with you. And uh, I'll just say that six months has gone by. My first mission is done here and I'm getting ready to land. And this is what the Soyuz looks like when it, when it lands. And the Soyuz would also land in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, so in that uh, little tiny capsule at the bottom there, there's three people who have been in space for six and a half months. And um, we're not as strong as we were before we launched, but we're in pretty good shape. And as you see, we come down on one parachute, we fire some braking engines just above the ground cloud and dust uh, and that's the little bitty spaceship that we are in and uh, if you can imagine three people in that thing it's very very tight and cramped uh, but this was the uh, the landing day for me and getting out into fresh air was really quite wonderful and uh, seeing some familiar faces uh, just feeling the cool wind on my face smelling grass hearing birds it was really it was wonderful to come home although part of me wished I was still in space uh, and what's happening now is uh, we're still working on the space station and doing experiments, but we're now working on getting back to the moon. And we want to get back there in a way that was is very different than we did many, many years ago. We want to go back and explore much more of it. And uh, we want to uh, make a base on the moon, just like we have a station in low Earth orbit. We'd like to have a station on the surface of the moon to do a lot of science and learn how to live on the moon. And then eventually to, to go to Mars which is much further away. And uh, it's a much bigger challenge to get people there and to explore. So as Victor said, we, we really need new people. We need new explorers. We need new engineers and scientists uh, and people from many different walks of life to help us with this effort. We fully expect this to be international as well. And it makes us stronger as a people. So I will um, kind of put in a couple of my points as well, very similar to, to what Victor mentioned. Um, these are the things that I find really fuel us. Uh, so curiosity being the big one. If you love learning and you're just curious, that that can really drive you to, to want to keep learning all the time. And you do not need to be a genius. You do not need to be the smartest person in the room at all. Uh, it's hard work that gets you what you want. And I can tell you that I'm no genius uh, and, and mostly in the astronaut office, and I would say internationally is true as well, most of us got there because we worked really hard, not because we're really smart. And that's the kind of person that you can easily spend six months in space with. Uh, and if you can find your peers, find people who think like you do, uh, it's really important. And then find something you love. Uh, and you can't really get good at something unless you want to and, uh, I think someone has an open microphone. Um, I'm going to end here. Uh, this is another person who was hoping to join us and wasn't able to. This is Stephanie Wilson, who is one of my mentors at NASA and was my boss for a long time. Uh, just an amazing person. And uh, we hope to see her flying again sometime very soon. So um, I will stop there. Last time, he's hearing came back. If it's the second time you wrapped a hair drum and you know there's no surgery or anything that's a remedy for wrapped a hair drum. Like there's nothing, there's no surgery that can cure a wrapped a Okay, just um, after getting. Wendy, if you can still hear me, I, I can take us. some questions and um, yeah, I think we've yeah okay. Okay, I can I can take some questions for a little bit if that works out. So Mike, it looks like we've got some in the chat. Um, someone wants to know how it feels when you're in zero gravity. Feels good. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, at, at first it's very uh, disorienting and you almost feel seasick. But after a couple of days you get used to it and you can fly uh, like a bird. It's it's really quite amazing. And, and you just learn to, to move around in it uh, very easily. So it takes, 
it's not fun at the first, but it gets better. And we as humans just adapt really well. Wenya, are you uh, are you on? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. I just checked okay, on great. that. Come, come, come. We have some questions in the audience as well. So. Hi, Mike. Uh, Hi. hi, Mike. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, this is Suresh here. Uh, I have been, my kids have been doing my whole level in the uh, uh, Italian school year, in the international school year. And now it's the beginning of them for to uh, pursue into their career. Like they'd be doing the A level, then their uh, universities. So I just brought them here. To, it was so, so it was so fantastic. Your uh, uh, presentation was so inspiring also for the teacher to know more about uh, uh, space science. Uh, so what people were, uh, kids were thinking is, uh, what, what about space is only an astronaut? As you said, clearly said, there's a lot of things like a uh, lot of departments also involved in uh, space science. Uh, so uh, it will be very helpful. I just, my question is, uh, like a kids, when they want to uh, aspire in their career, what is the beginning point to get into space science in, in whatever the fields they may be, they may be interested in IT or they may be interested in geology, zoology, or medical science, whatever it is. Where is the beginning point for them to get into the space science? Yeah, that that is a great point. You know, we we've got a we've got a few astronauts, but we have hundreds, literally thousands of other people who work in the space program every day. Uh, and they are engineers to a large extent. They're engineers, but they're scientists, they're technicians, they're builders. We even have artists. Uh, we've got IT people, as you mentioned. And every day with the space station program, we work together across borders, across international lines, across languages. Uh, and so there's people in all throughout Europe and Russia and the US, Japan, Canada, uh, and there's even some folks from Africa who work experiments in space. So it's many different fields to go. And so I would say the starting point um, is really, you need to find something that's useful to the space program. And, and that's very broad. Uh, and you can find that just by, by reading a lot more about space. But find one of those things that you really love, whether it's computer programming or um, even artistry with, with space or engineering is, is one of our big things or building things uh, and get really good at it. <laughs> um, you know, again, you, you can't get really good at something unless you really like it. So it's, it's really important to find something that, that you love that you can pursue. And as you learn more about it, you find out where those intersections are with, with space programs. Um, you know, right now, the European Space Agency is many different countries, 15 countries that, that come together and work. Um, the, uh, the obviously NASA is very large uh, as well, um, but everywhere is expanding. So it's um, it's a time of newer opportunities, not just the big space agencies, but but industry, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic. All of these are actually international companies centered in the U.S. But the opportunities for the people listening here when they're finishing with their education are going to be so many more than they have been in the past. So you will be able to work in, in the space flight industry in ways that we haven't been able to for, for many, many years. So find something you love that's, um, that's useful to the space program or to space exploration, get really good at it. And the, the further you go in it, just learn as much as you can about these, the agencies, the international programs and the companies who are doing this work. Um, and and the opportunities are expanding. They're, they're growing like crazy. Well, that's thank you so much uh, for your information. So uh, I think the kids will get more inspired in getting into the space science with their their interested subjects uh, uh, going line with the space science. That's what uh, we are looking as a future opportunity for the kids. Uh, uh, it's it's more opportunity for them. Thank yeah, you excellent. so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I see you there. You can. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, it's muted for some reason. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry, don't hear. Hey, can you, hey, mate, can you there hear There we me? go. Yep, gotcha. All right, uh, I was saying my name is Kim from Jacaranda Secondary. Uh, my question is a bit technical, but I'll run you through it. Uh, you said it takes, it get, you need to get from zero to 75,500 miles per hour in eight minutes to get to orbital velocity, right? So my question is, once you get to orbit velocity, how do you stay within Earth's orbit with, uh, without Earth's gravity pulling the satellite in? Are you using thrusters to repel against the gravity or is there a specific like sweet spot where the, the shuttle will remain in orbit for permanently? Mm -hmm. And if it does, does the does do you does the shuttle just permanently stay in that orbit? Like if you start if you didn't touch the sh the shuttle, would it permanently stay there forever, or would it eventually fall into Earth's orbit, Earth's gravity? Sorry. Yeah, so that's a beautiful question, Kim. So the the answer is is two things. There is absolutely a sweet spot. So uh, when we say more or less seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Uh, we are extremely exact about the speed that we need to be going for a certain altitude. So, for instance, at the space station, uh, it is about 17,243 miles an hour or so. Um, and if you go faster, your orbit gets higher. If you go much faster, you're, you'll go flying out of orbit. You'll head to the moon or somewhere. If you go slower, your orbit gets lower, and then you start intersecting the atmosphere and drag with the air will pull you down. So it is a sweet spot. Um, but the other part of your question is also true. We continually have to thrust um, because even at the altitude of the station, there's a little bit of atmosphere which drags us down. So every year we actually have to keep boosting the space station to, to make sure that the drag of the atmosphere doesn't bring it down. So if we did nothing to it, it would come down. If we did nothing to the space shuttle, it, it would come down as well. But once you get up there, it takes just tiny little thrusts to stay in orbit. But that's a great question. All right, thank you for the answer, Mike. Yeah. Hello? Hello. Um, uh, is it possible for the space station to uh, actually fall down to earth if the like for example if the thrusters aren't really working so it, it's a good question um it, it is definitely possible but uh we've had stations in space for well since the 70s for 50 years and uh we've always planned for enough fuel and engine firing thrusting to keep them up there and so that's always happened until a space station comes to the end of its life which which they do uh, and then we're very deliberate about thrusting. So we put it into the ocean in a place where there's no people. So eventually the space station, as big and wonderful as it is, will come to the end of its life and be replaced by new space stations. Uh, and when that happens, we will use special engines and we'll, we'll drop the space station out of orbit into the ocean uh, in a place in the um, Eastern uh, Pacific. Uh, the southeastern Pacific, a very deep place, 2,500 miles from any land whatsoever. So, no, we've, we've never had one foul out of orbit that, that we didn't want to, uh, but, but eventually that's where we'll park it. There's a related question in the chat about how we get satellites to orbit and how they stay in orbit. Yeah, a good question. The, um, the uh, satellites we fly fly on rockets just like people we fly, um, but uh, they tend to be a bit smaller. And sometimes we can launch many satellites in one launch, uh, as, as many as, as 100, actually, if they're really small satellites. Or, or there may be just one really big one that we launch, like the James Webb Space Telescope. So we have many different rockets uh, in many different countries that launch satellites into orbit. Uh, I do see a, a question that's interesting. Does going to space re reduce life expectancy from Wanza? Um, it's a really interesting question because as a medical doctor, we study every system in the body to see how it uh, holds up with space. And, and so far, we don't see that. We see people who fly in space, even who spend months at a time in space, don't, don't seem to have any reduced life expectancy. 
Now, we all have pretty healthy habits. You have to be pretty healthy to be an astronaut. But um, even though it does change a lot of your body, it takes a toll in some ways. Uh, we don't see that it changes life expectancy at all. Uh, so it's a really good question, but it's something we're going to continue to study because when we go to Mars, that, that could take three years or so. So um, that's a lot. Um, and, and I have to uh, look at another question there from, I guess, Nachi. Uh, is it true that liquids excreted from the body are reused in the spacesuit? Uh, not in the spacesuit. Um, we, uh, in, in the spacesuit, you're just in there for six hours and it's not much. But when you're in the space station and you're working every day, you know, we have a toilet uh, that you you pee into and then we will clean up that pee and make it into drinking water, which sounds awful. Um, but it actually works really, really well. It makes really pure water. And uh, it's nice because then you you're recycling 90 percent of that water. Even your sweat goes into the air and we we reclaim it for drinking water. Um, and that's huge. That makes us almost a closed system. And then we don't have to launch all that water. So uh, it's one of the things we'd like to, to learn how to do more on the earth so that we can better use the water that we have. It's such a precious resource. We have a question uh, from the audience here. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, hello, my name is Mitra, and my question is, how exactly do you really like keep track of time in space? Well, keeping track of time is, is a good question because again, we go around the earth 16 times a day, which means 16 sunrises, 16 sunsets every day. And so uh, we made a decision because there's so many different countries to go on universal time or Greenwich mean time uh, from, from the UK. Um, and then that kind of splits the difference between all the different countries. Some people have to get up early. Some people have to stay up late. And as far as the crew on board, we regulate it with the lights. So when we decide that it's nighttime and time to go to bed, we start, we close all the windows because the sunlight will blast through there otherwise. And we turn down the lights or turn off the lights and just make it night. Uh, and in the morning, when it's time for us to get up, we'll get up and turn on the lights and open the windows. And so we artificially make it daytime for us, like you would on a submarine or in a cave. And that works out pretty well for us. Okay, it's a great you. question. Yeah. What happens when you don't exercise in space? If you don't exercise, your bones and muscles will get very weak. And, um, and your heart also will get weak. And so when you come back from space, if you don't exercise, you'll be like a bowl of jello. <laughs> It'll be hard to move, hard to walk, everything gets hard. So we don't do that. We, we've never had people in space without the ability to exercise. So a good question. Okay, thank I you. see another one. Uh, thank you. I see another one queued up in the audience. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Limpo. I would like to find out. I've seen a lot of um, videos showing uh, spacecrafts. Uh, are they rockets? I don't know the technical terms going out to space, but I've never seen how they actually get out of space coming back to Earth. Uh, so I've always had a question. Well, yeah. I've always had a question. I know they there's always burning out that goes on. So how do you just manage to cut, to cut through and get back to Earth? Yeah, you know, it's a great question because uh, um, when we launch into space, we have all the cameras and videos on the ground and you can, you can see it happen. When we come back from space, there's no cameras up there to watch it happen. So uh, it, it leaves it to, to question, uh, leaves it to imagination. But um, here's what happens. So, <laughs> excuse me. When we launch into space, uh, it's all rockets that make us go through the atmosphere and go that fast. Um, but when we come back, we have to slow down from 17,500 miles an hour to zero. We have to do everything in reverse. And instead of using rocket power, we use the air, we use the atmosphere. And uh, the drag with the atmosphere slows us down, right? So, you know, if you're in a car and you're traveling fast and you roll down the window and you put your hand out, you feel the resistance, the, the air just blasts your, your hand back. 
And it's the same with us. When we're coming screaming through the atmosphere, the force of that air slows us down. And uh, we can do that in about seven minutes or so, almost the same amount of time it, it would take to get up into space with rocket power. But instead of rocket power, we use the air to slow us down. And the friction makes it very, very hot. So you may have seen some videos of almost flames and, and sparks coming off the spaceship as it comes through the air to slow down. And that, that is real. It gets really, really hot right outside the spaceship. Uh, but it works. Uh, and uh, when you come screaming through the atmosphere, by the time you're um, maybe a few tens of thousands of feet above the ground, you're just dropping straight down. You, you've lost all of that speed, that orbital velocity, and then you can put your parachute out and, and land softly. So uh, that, it's a really good question, but rocket power going up to get going fast, air resistance coming down to get going slow. And do you use, um, is, uh, what, what, what equipment is that? We know there are rockets going up, but what equipment is coming down? When we come down, the most important piece of equipment is called your heat shield. And uh, we, we talk about our heat shields all the time because that, that means we can come home. The heat shield is what um, first meets the air as you're coming through. So all that friction heat will hit the heat shield and will make sparks and flames, but that holds you together. That's your drag device. It's like your hand in the, in the, in the air in a car. Um, and that heat shield is the most important piece of equipment at that point of your life, to be honest. Uh, you don't wanna turn the spaceship so that the, uh, the rest of the spaceship is in the direction you're traveling because you'd, you'd burn up. So you always want the heat shield. That's your most important piece of equipment. Once you've um, slowed down enough, then your, your second most important piece of equipment is your parachute. That's what pops out and drops you very gently onto the ground with the Soyuz or into the ocean with the SpaceX Dragon. So heat shields and parachutes, those are the main ones. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I I have a question. I'm a an aerospace engineering student uh, okay. here in India. I'm from Zambia. Uh, my question is: uh, uh, I've been researching on uh, roles uh, in uh, aerospace engineering in uh, the US. Because uh, at the moment we know the aerospace engineering powers uh, in the world, uh, uh, obviously the US at uh, its peak and uh, other countries follow behind. So looking at that, I was, uh, I've been planning uh, on a career path that uh, leads me to uh, entering into uh, aerospace roles in, uh, in the USA. But uh, according to my research, uh, most of the roles are only offered to uh, you, U.S. citizens. So my question is, does it? Be, be, I don't know if, uh, if the government considers uh, the, the the space technology, uh, such as uh, SpaceX, uh, NASA, and so on, to be uh, high technology that has to be uh, kept away from uh, others. So I don't really know um, what can a person like me, who's uh, studying aerospace engineering, and uh, wants to join uh, such organizations do in order uh, to get one or two roles uh, in uh, those specialized companies? Okay, that's a, a really good question. Um, and the answer is, is sometimes that changes. So you're absolutely right. More recently, like in the last uh, very few years, um, almost governments everywhere in the world have decided that space technology is more sensitive than it used to be. And uh, they require US citizenship to work both for the agencies and for some of the big companies. Now, that doesn't make it easier on our industry. And um, for instance, for a big company like SpaceX or Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, it makes it harder for them to find quality people because uh, in, in spite of the fact that um, they, they want US citizens, we're still multinational in the US. We have a workforce that's from all over the, the world, uh, but a lot of them are now dual citizens. And so one of the, the pathways that people take frequently, and I know many at SpaceX are like this, is they will come from another country 
Um, and uh, they will actually do research for a period of years before they are either awarded a green card or citizenship. And, and most of them are dual citizens from, from uh, different countries. Um, and that research gives them two things. First of all, um, you, you, it's easy to have access to do to work at a university like that, but it also gives you connections to the aerospace industry. So that's a big thing. But the other thing is that it, it gives you further tools, further educational background that makes you more valuable to the aerospace industry. And then they do extremely well when they come out and, uh, and look for places to work. So in fact, a lot of people at SpaceX are, are exactly like that. A lot of people at NASA are, are exactly like that. Um, having said that, it, it, it could change again. It, it, it could be easier in a few years um, if we relieve some of these because the fact is a lot of this technology is so widespread right now, many different countries launching rockets um, that uh, you know, it's, it's not so secret as it, as it used to be. And to be sure, it, it's almost more proprietary than, than government secret. That's, that's what we're talking about. And we're also trying to protect an industry. But, but that would be one pathway I, I would recommend considering. Um, come to the US or to Europe or, or to any country that's, that's doing spaceflight, try to get involved in, in research until such time as you can get a level of government acceptance, either green card or citizenship that allows you to, to actually work in the industry. Um, that's, that's how it is now. It wasn't like this 20 years ago and maybe 10 years ago, it'll be a little bit different, but, um, but the universities I think offer a really good entry point. No, I thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mike. Uh, my name is Henry, and I'm a first year student, first year physics student here in Zambia. And mm -hmm. I would like to find out if there is a specific area of physics that I should focus on if I want to be an astronaut. And are there any opportunities like for students here in Africa? Because most of the opportunities I see on NASA are for American citizens. Yeah, well, let's see. For the, the first part is the easy question. <laughs> any, any part of physics that you really like. Um, we have people with background in physics all throughout NASA, whether they're working human spaceflight, spaceships, exploration, uh, all through of our, our centers. And the same is true with the European Space Agency. There's, there's people with physics backgrounds everywhere. And they do everything from, from particle physics to advanced uh, propulsion, where we still need some physics breakthroughs, uh, nuclear propulsion, for instance, uh, to astrophysics, looking at the behavior of stars and planets and whatnot. So uh, physics is such a wide area. Choose what you really love to do. Um, and then again, read as much as you can about the space programs throughout the world and see where those intersections are for you. Uh, and it is a truism that um, the, you know, the opportunities tend to concentrate in the countries or the, the continents where the activity is being done. And so you know, if, you're, if you're thirsty, you gotta go where the water is. Um, and if, if this is something you really wanna do, you, you will probably have to be a person of two worlds, which again, many people in the space program are. Uh, so you, you have to look at either the US or Europe uh, potentially Russia, uh, Canada, Japan, places where they're doing space already um, and figure out how you can fit into one of those. But, but again, I, I emphasize that being a person of two worlds uh, is very possible and it's actually pretty common in the space program. And um, so you kind of have to think about tailoring your life that way. Never close any doors for sure, but uh, go, go where, you're, where the activity that interests you is being done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, how do balloon rockets go into space when they don't move at the same speed as real rockets? Because I've seen many videos of rockets, homemade rockets using balloons to go to space. Using balloons? Mm-hmm. Giant balloons. Ah, okay, okay. So, yeah, um, that's, that's a really interesting question right now because... Um, We've got these big balloons that are going to carry people um, and really to the edge of space, not quite as high as, as uh, meets the definition of space, which is 100 kilometers, but pretty high. And they will take people in uh, these special balloons that are massive, they're huge, um, and you'll be high enough to see the curve of the earth, the blackness of space, 
uh, and you'll really get an experience of space in a way in these balloons. Uh, they just they take many hours to get up there and many hours to come down, not quite to space, and they're not traveling at orbital velocity because they don't have to. They literally can go straight up and come straight down, uh, which is really quite amazing because they never really escape Earth's gravity. But um, I have some friends who are working at a company that are getting ready to take people in these big balloons to the edge of space, we'll call it that. So good question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I see Hi. another person. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Sarah and I would like to know where you like get oxygen when you're in space for you in order to yeah. breathe. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we have a, a, a few different ways to get it. We can take tanks of oxygen, high pressure oxygen, and um, we can breathe that. Um, but the other thing is I mentioned that we recycle our, our urine and our water. And if you take regular water and put some salt in it or some electrolytes as we call it, and then run electricity through it, it gives off oxygen, which we can breathe, and hydrogen, which we, we vent overboard because hydrogen goes boom if it burns. Um, and a lot of our oxygen now comes from that. We generate our own oxygen on the space station by, as we call it, cracking water. We, we turn water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, back into oxygen to breathe. Um, and that water comes from either tanks of water or the sweat that we reclaim in the air or the, the urine that, that we uh, give off. So uh, it's pretty cool to be able to make your own oxygen up there and know where your next breath is coming from. So good question. Thank you. Hmm? Hi, David. I'm Clement from Jacklander Combined School. I've got two questions. The first one is. Speak up, please. Okay. I'm Clement from Jacklander Combined School. Uh, my first question is Is it possible to find someone got lost in space? Then I can tell there's a difference between here down and space. But what was your experience when you reached down here on Earth? Okay, what was my experience when I reached space? Is that what you're asking? No, when you reached down here on Earth. Oh, when we reached down here. Okay. Um, so, um, is it possible? It's if uh, the first question is: it possible to find somebody who's lost in space? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, that's easy, actually, um, because we can track things in space pretty easily uh, you know, if they're close in the vicinity of the Earth and the Moon. Uh, the really big question is, is it possible to rescue somebody? Because if you're lost in space, it's probably because your spaceship isn't quite working, and it may be very difficult to get another spaceship to them. Um, your, your other question is, what, what was it like, I guess, coming back when I reached the Earth after being in space for a long time? Uh, it's it's a very interesting thing because you've been in zero gravity all that time. Your sense of balance is all about flying in three dimensions. And all of a sudden, and you don't weigh anything, all of a sudden you come to the earth and you feel heavy. You feel your weight for the first time in six and a half months. You feel like a magnet is pulling you down everywhere um, and you feel very weak. Uh, so it takes a while to get used to being in gravity again. You, you just, you feel like a blob um, and you have to be very careful and uh, re-challenge yourself with standing up and walking. And eventually over a period of days to weeks, you start getting your strength back again and your balance back again. But it's, uh, you, can, uh, you can almost get a, a version of seasickness coming back to earth in the first few hours because your sense of balance is so different it's so readjusted but uh, it takes a while it's actually kind of fun to experience in a way but uh, you you won't be running fast you won't be carrying heavy things <laughs> so and uh, i would love to know uh what thing do you use to communicate with one another so we have a large uh, system of radios on the space station in all sorts of different frequencies. And we can talk to Earth with just voice. We can talk with video. We can send email. Uh, I literally could call on the phone from the space station to my family every day. 
So we have many, many different ways to communicate. Um, once we go to the moon, there'll be fewer ways. And once we go to Mars, it will be very, very difficult to communicate because it's so far away. But um, right now from the low Earth orbit that uh, our space station is in, we, we communicate really easily. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, and Moenya, I'll have to tell you, I, I will need to go in a couple of minutes here also. Um, I, I will actually be in the space station simulator uh, okay. pretty soon, so. <laughs> okay, can we have one more question uh, from, two more questions, uh, there's one in the chat. Uh, excuse me, how does it how does it feel to be in the space in the, in the spacecraft when it's reaching thousand five wait seven thousand five hundred uh, miles per hour? That's a good question. So, uh, really quick on that one, when you're reaching that speed, you feel really heavy because the g forces are high. You're you're accelerating. You're you're making more speed. And you feel like you're you're pressed into your seat, but as soon as the engines cut off, you feel nothing. So you go from weighing three times your body weight to nothing. And that, that second that that happens is, is just really, really strange. You feel like you've been hung upside down because fluids came up in your head uh, and all of a sudden you're floating. So that moment. Bye. 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 <laughs> How about that, James uh, Mukopa? Sorry, Mike, what are you saying? Uh, I see a, a hand raised from James. Yes. Uh, that's an insight. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask uh, what NASA is doing to, in, in terms of finding other fuels, other, apart from these uh, liquid-based fuels, what uh, other means or methods that NASA can use to get to, get to the moon? So apart getting to, yes. Um, so uh, getting to the moon is, is not too difficult from fuel standpoint. Um, what we're really interested in is, can we use fuels at places where we want to explore? So if we go to the moon, we know that there's ice up there in the form of water. And I mentioned that we can make oxygen and hydrogen out of ice, out of water, um, but we can also use oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel, we can burn them. So we'd like to have a spaceship that runs on liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen because we can make it on the moon and we can use that to come home or to go further into the solar system. And the same is true on Mars. So um, the fuels we have now, kerosene, oxygen, they work really well, methane. Um, but uh, we'd really like to be able to use oxygen and hydrogen. And then eventually to go to Mars, we'd like nuclear engines so we could go faster because it's a long, long way. Uh, Mwenya, I think I'm going to have to just take one more question. Okay. And I, okay. I will leave it to your leadership to uh, to choose. Go. Did you end? Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Parmitha Suresh. And so my question for you is, earlier on, you said that um, astronauts have a plan on going to Mars. Um, so my question is related to this. So why do astronauts want to go to Mars and not the other planets? That's a great question. Well, to be sure, we'd like to go many different places. And it is not just the astronauts. You know, we, we are a, a small number of people among thousands of people who work for the space program in many, many different countries. We wanna to go to Mars um, because it's very Earth-like. When you look at all the other planets in the solar system, uh, the one that looks most like Earth is, is Mars. And so we can learn a lot about our planet by, by what has happened on Mars. Um, and Mars is very interesting for so many reasons. And one of the most interesting questions that we have, that's an open question, is whether there's any life on Mars. We want to know if there's anything alive there and what it's like. Um, that would change everything to know that we're not the only place of life in the universe, quite frankly. Just knowing that one of our close planetary brethren has life would be huge. 
And we, in general, would like to see ourselves moving out through the solar system to explore, to colonize, to, to utilize resources. Um, and Mars is a very logical place because we could easily see ourselves living there with the, there's lots of water ice, the gravity is probably good, there's no atmosphere, uh, so we would have to provide that. But um, it's part of our whole plan to explore and to colonize and, and to kind of reach out uh, as a civilization. It's, it's a survival tactic in a way, uh, but mostly from our standpoint, it's all about exploration. So, Moenya, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop here and, um, and uh, go join my people, my crew. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for having yeah. us. There are so many questions, even right now there. Are... Sorry, yeah, so after, um, we're going to have some few minutes with Kim uh, once you're gone so that she can take on some more questions. But thank oh, you so much for having us. Hope we can do something like this again. Because as you can see, there are people that still want to ask you questions, even though yeah. <laughs> you need to run. So hopefully okay. we can have something soon. Okay, well, absolutely, we can do something again, and, and we'll try to have a few more of us on, on the line. The more, the merrier. So. Yes. Okay, thank okay. you so much for thank having so us, much, Mike. Mike. All thank right, you. it's my pleasure. You guys all take care. We'll see you. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mike. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Okay, Monia, how would you like to proceed? Should I take the ones from the chat, or do you have some live ones? Yeah, there's um, some people that you would like to have yeah. There's some people here that want to ask. Uh, we can get someone from the audience uh, before we go to the that ones. That sounds in the great. Chat. Okay. Cool. Hello. Hi. Um, um, my name is Ndua, coming from Jacaranda Secondary. So I've got a, a pretty cool question, and it's. <clears throat> in astronauts, aerospace engineering. So what advice were you going to give to a person who wants to start a company in our country, Zambia? So, okay, I'm not going to use this inspiration to become an astronaut in a foreign country, maybe develop our country, which is a little bit behind in stuff like this. So what advice were you going to give to us here now to, more of an inspiration in starting a company or maybe futures, future inspiration. Okay, something that's going to inspire people here to maybe open or start a company in the future, something like that. I think that, uh, you know, when, when Mike was talking about um, ways to get to the US and maybe, you know, dual citizenship when he was talking also about where we would deorbit. Um, I was thinking about you have so much open space there that being able to launch rockets from there would be fantastic. Um, so I would encourage you to realize that space is opening up in a way that um, we haven't seen in our lifetime before. Um, it takes a lot of money to get to space. Um, right now it's very expensive. Uh, the components to design, develop and test everything. Um, and you wanna make sure that it's really safe, but it's it literally could be done anywhere. So I would study what the entrepreneurs have done to start some of the new, the new independent companies. So look at SpaceX, look at, at Blue Origin, um, Look at some of the companies around the world that are new entrants into space. There are companies in India, there are companies all over the world um, who are building rockets and launching them. My recommendation would be to start with launching small payloads and then work your way up to launching big satellites or, or trying to get something that's human rated. Okay, I've got another one. So how many space stations do you currently have in space? We currently have one space station that is the International Space Station, which as Mike mentioned, it's 15 countries, um, including the US and Russia. China has built a space station and I believe in the past month, 
that they may have actually completed it. So at the moment, there are only two, but there is a company called Axiom here in the US, um, as well as two others that are looking at doing a commercial space station. The reason is in space, we can manufacture um, medications, we can do 3D printing of tissue. Um, there are things that you can do in space that you can't do on earth because of gravity. And so I feel like eventually we'll probably have several stations um, that will be privately run, run and you know won't necessarily have anything to do with NASA um, because there's such potential in low earth orbit. Those are great questions. Okay. There is a question from the chat. Which states uh, next? Up? Can you, can you? Hi, Kim. So Hi. There's, a, there, there's a question from Noah, Noah Sichivula, who wants to know, how long do you think it is before space mining is practiced internationally? It's a great question. Um, Timeline wise, I'm trying to keep up with what, uh, what we've got planned. Um, I think the first lunar launch is scheduled for later this year. Um, it's probably going to be a couple of years before we actually send people. And at that point, we're going to have to explore the crater. Um, Shackleton Crater is our target right now because we believe that there's water in there. And as Mike said, if we can find water, um, we believe there's ice. From the ice, we get water. From the water, we crack the water and we can build fuel. Um, so I think before we get into a mining, um, it could be close to 10 years. Um, hopefully it won't take that long, but I think before we're actually operational on the surface of the moon, I think it's going to be iterative, um, and take a little while, mainly because of funding. We just, we don't have the money to do everything that we want to do and we have to do it safely. So the first thing we're going to need to do is build a small space station, um, just a few components that will actually orbit the moon. And that gives us a basis to work nearby the moon so that when we go to the surface, we can maximize our time there. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, there is another question from the chat, which is, um, uh, what, how, how are other kinds of waste managed while on the space station? both from daily operations and from the astronauts. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the water reclamation system that um, rather we're, we're deriving it from the urine or rather it's wicking moisture from the air. Um, we repurpose and reuse the water. Um, for other solid waste and, uh, you know, packing materials, things like that, when our clothes get dirty, um, we don't have washers and dryers on uh, on space stations. So they literally, it's kind of gross, you guys. They literally wear their clothes till they can't stand it. And then it all goes into one of those resupply vehicles. So the SpaceX Dragon, um, when it comes up, we can actually send um, experiment samples and it returns to Earth. And so we have down mass capability. The other... Uh, U.S. resupply vehicle, the Cygnus, actually burns up in the atmosphere. So once we empty all of the supplies out of that and stow them where they're supposed to be, we start filling that Cygnus spacecraft with um, our trash. So the guy that's on orbit right now, our commander is, is Chell Lindgren. When he came home from his first mission, he was showing his son a video they passed over. So when they when they jettisoned the uh, the spacecraft that had all the trash in it, the module, the Cygnus module, they did another orbit. And as they came around, they were able to see that Cygnus spacecraft re-enter the atmosphere to burn up. And he showed his son this vi this video because it's rare that we actually get to see it. And uh, 
his son thought about it for a moment and he looked at him because it looks a lot like a shooting star. It's just this, you know, orange streak across the sky. So his son looked at him and said, so what you're telling me, dad, is one man's shooting star is another man's burning underwear. I got to be really careful what I wish upon. (laughs) So that's how we get rid of the rest of the trash. It burns up in the atmosphere. And that's, you know, when Mike was talking about deorbiting space station at the end of its life, most of that is going to burn up in the atmosphere and what doesn't will sink to the bottom of the ocean and become um, an artificial reef. I've got a question. What happens, what happened to the space station MIR? Space station Mir, that's exactly what happened to Mir. So that was the Russian space station. And toward the end of its life, we started doing joint operations with the Russians. And, um, you know, when you think about it, as, as that station's whipping around the earth, you know, somewhere between 17 and 18,000 miles an hour, um, as it goes from the light to the dark side of the earth, the temperatures that are fluctuating are two to 300 degrees above and 200 to 300 degrees below zero. It's a little wear and tear on any material. Um, So you have to make sure that all the seals are great and that you don't lose pressurization. So after a while, a space station is going to age out. And once it ages out and it's no longer safe for humans, um, it's exactly what we did. We took all the people or the Russians took all the people off, anything they wanted to keep. And then from the ground, they changed, they, they were able to command the station to degrade the orbit and they just let it burn up in the atmosphere and then whatever was left fell into the ocean. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two more questions uh, and then we wrap it up, Kim. So the next question Sounds goes. Sounds great. Okay. Hello, Kim. Um, my name is Miracle, and my question is, how do you eat in space? How do you eat? Yes. Uh, pretty much the same way you do you you do here on the Earth, um, except for the fact that they tell me that it's impossible not to play with your food because it does float. Um, most of what they have up there is dehydrated so they're like little um almost like like a like a juice packet or something like that um in the galley there is a spigot that uh they're able to plug into the pouch of of dehydrated food and you can choose either hot water or cold water to rehydrate it um some of the other food is called an mre meals ready to eat So it's prepared. So you'd find in one of those packets, something like a chili or a stew that they simply heat up and just eat it right out of that envelope. Um, As, as they uh, get resupplied vehicles, sometimes they'll send up like ice cream bars or maybe some fruit. So that's very exciting. That's some of the only fresh stuff they get, but yeah, they eat out of an envelope a lot. And uh, with, with being in zero gravity or microgravity, the fluids in your body collect in the upper regions. So you get, um, it almost feels like you have a head cold for some people. And you know how, when you've got sinus congestion, it's hard to taste anything because your sense of smell is gone. Um, it's kind of like that. They get a lot of fluid in the, in their sinus cavities and, and in the upper regions. So the food doesn't taste the same way it tastes on earth. Their sense of taste because their sense of smell has been uh, compromised is the same. So we use a lot of hot sauce. Um, if you think about salt and pepper, you have to put it in water or oil to make it stick to the food because if not, it would just fly off to the filters. So um, they each get to choose, they go through like uh, food tastings and then based on what their caloric needs are for the day and the things that they like, they get to set a menu. Um, but they do eat a lot of the same stuff over and over. So by the time they get home, they're ready for something fresh. Thank you.
Uh, hi, my name is Daniel Musonda, and I wanted to ask her, how can you advise someone who wants to be an, an astronaut? Well, I think Mike gave you guys some really great advice. The most important thing that you can do is find something that you truly love. The reason you have to find something that you love is you're always going to be better at the things you enjoy doing. Um, there's such a small percentage of people who apply to be astronauts who actually can be astronauts simply because the spacecraft are tiny um, and you know you can only pick so many people. So it's really important to do work that you really, really enjoy so that as you apply, we've had astronauts that have applied 10 times before getting selected. So don't give up do something that you love and become really, really great at it. Um, most importantly, be somebody, be a teammate that you would want to be locked in a tin can with for six months. Um, if you are somebody who's good with your hands and very adaptable, like Mike said, our astronauts come from all different backgrounds, but a couple of things that they all have in common is they learn quickly. They're good with their hands as far as repairing things. Um, and they have great, bless you, great teamwork skills um, so that uh, you're somebody that you could be in a confined space with for long periods of time. Um, I also would encourage you to look for internships where you get to watch people doing the things that you wish to do. Um, having practical applications of the things that you guys are learning in school is always a great opportunity. So research internship opportunities. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. It's been such a wonderful time uh, starting my day with you as you're ending yours. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and look forward to having uh, Dr. Barrett back and, and maybe a couple of his colleagues the next time we get together. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and just for the people in the audience, obviously I'm going to talk to them after, uh, but also those in the audience, like the online, uh, the virtual audience. I hope everyone knows, because everyone's asking the, the, the common question is, how do I get, um, how do I become an astronaut or how do I work for NASA? Always remember that there are different careers at NASA. There are teachers at NASA, there are artists at NASA, there are doctors at NASA. The post itself said, how does a medical doctor, um, like how did a medical doctor end up becoming an astronaut? So don't uh, limit your career choices. Don't think just because uh, you have to be an engineer to be at NASA. No, you can be a teacher at NASA, but it's what astronaut Barrett said. How does, how does your career choice, so let's say you're a teacher, how does you being a teacher, like what do you contribute to NASA? So pretty much like this uh, uh, program, the career guidance program, is a program that's impacting young people. And it was about presenting this to the people at NASA at Johnson Space Center and telling them that kids here that have um, these passions of space science, and they are open to like, as long as you have ideas that are unique, as long as you are, have ideas that are different, you can join NASA. You don't necessarily have to be an engineer. So that's a common question that I see people keep asking, like, how do I work for NASA? Don't limit it to saying you have to be an, uh, an engineer or anything else. You can be a teacher and work for NASA. Sometimes it's not about, like Elon Musk, for instance, he's been sending people to space. He hasn't been to space. So sometimes it's not about you going to space. It's about how are you helping people go to space? So always remember that don't limit and say, no, I have to be an engineer to, to get to the space station. No, you can be any other, uh, uh, like you can choose any career choice. So sometimes it's about you helping other people to go into space. You don't necessarily have to go to space. So that's my advice to everyone who's in the- That's such a now. great point. And also- uh, At every NASA that. center, at every NASA center, um, and honestly, any, any organization that's sending people to space, every job that, it would, that exists in running a small city exists at an aerospace, you know, at, 
at NASA, not necessarily at, at, you know, an individual company. But if you think about it, someone has to prepare the food, someone has to train the astronauts. Um, we teach them. It's like a big campus. They're constantly in classes. Um, someone has to sew their spacesuits together. Um, somebody has to work on the computers. Um, it's, it's every discipline. I am not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm a storyteller. So, um, I've done corporate training. My background is really different and I've worked out here close to the amount, the same amount of time as, as Mike. I've been, um, at NASA for more than 30 years and I've had the opportunity to work with training, um, at the big pool where, where Victor's in right now. Um, and, and in building nine where, where Mike is headed over to, to get into a mock-up of a space station. Um, space is going to be a frontier that all of us are going to be able to take part in, whether we're physically going or not. I think in the next several years, there's, there's an opportunity for us to do that. But in the meantime, whether you're part of a support crew, having a shared mission um, that's bigger than yourself is a pursuit that will fulfill you. Um, I, like I said, with more than 30 years out here, I enjoy my work. Um, I get to meet people like you. I get to meet people like, like Dr. Barrett. And um, I just encourage you to, to follow your passions and um, I definitely encourage you to start your own aerospace company. You guys fly rockets right from there. You've got all kinds of space. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Kim, thank you so much for making time to be with us um, today. We really value um, the information that you've shared. Uh, and of course, for also helping coordinate uh, uh, Dr. Barrett as well as Victor. This has really been an amazing experience. A lot has been learned. Um, so we look forward to having more of such interactions. Um, I think that um, there are many other, you know, young people, young students uh, that aspire and are interested in, in, in learning more about, about space. So uh, please do not uh, uh, do not reject us when we reach out uh, to engage because this is information that is certainly uh, mind blowing. So thank you so much. Um, at this point, um, I think that um, um, we have concluded the, the you know our pre, our engagement. Uh, Mwenya can speak a little bit about the Paidea project and uh, and Eskag. Pardon? Yeah. yeah, so well, Mwenya will speak a little so bit. Much. Thank you so much, yes. And then Mwenya will speak at this point, you can hop off. If people want to hop off, they can. Mwenya will speak a little bit about what she's doing here locally with her project, uh, in case there are people that would be interested in learning about that as well. We're so excited about the project and absolutely, um, we're all uh, part of the same, we're all from the same place. One of the, what I'll leave you with is what astronauts tell me is when you're growing up, you're from, you're from the town that you came from. And when you leave the town that you came from and possibly leave the region, you're from the, the country that you come from. When you leave the planet, we're all from the same place. We all have the same home. And so we are all connected um, and uh, we look forward to talking with you again in the future and we wish you the best with the program. Thanks for having us today and uh, keep stay, stay in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.
So when you know you can share with um Okay, I'm not going to say so much because like I know you guys have to go before your driver is almost here. But um I uh, thank you so much firstly for coming here, um, for being part of this. Uh, I didn't even know this was going to be possible. I pitched the idea at NASA uh, in February, and of course I slated it for July. So thankfully they did um, come on board with this. Uh, so I'm thankful that you guys did, um, did uh, come through. I just want to say that I, I had a common question, which is something that I said, um, most of you are asking how, uh, uh, how can I be an astronaut? I was in, I was in grade one when I said I wanted to be an astronaut and I changed to being an um, astrophysicist to being an aerospace engineer, but throughout my journey, um, what, what made me change career paths from like being an astronaut, astrophysicist and like aerospace engineering was that I started uh, realizing like what contributes to my country. What can I do that contributes to my country? And that's what started shaping my career path because it wasn't just about me. And even though, yes, up to now, I, of course, I'm not yet an astronaut. I mean, I studied actuarial science, so which is like mathematics. Uh, if those, uh, for people that don't know what actuarial science is, it's just a lot of mathematics on computers and on paper. But then what you always have to ask yourself, like from a background like ours in a third world country, or let me not say third world country, but like a developing nation, always ask what's going to contribute to your overall community. And that's what defined what my career choices were. Because I said, okay, I'm going to be an astronaut and then what? I'm going to be an astrophysicist. I'm going to study constellations and then what? I'm going to be an aerospace engineer and then what? Yes, aerospace engineering, at least when it comes to like right now, we see the airport has changed. Yeah, that changes. But right now, of course, like the Paidea project, it's a, it's a project on education. And this is what helped make this possible when it comes to like having this guidance talk um, uh, with like impact in you guys. So see, I'm not yet an astronaut, but I can still talk about all things astronomy. So many questions that you are asking, I could actually answer them. But I really wanted, uh, of course, astronaut Barrett and Kim to answer them. But there are questions that I have um, that I could answer as well. So just because I'm not an astronaut doesn't mean I can't still talk about space science. So you have to think like that. Always think about what's going to help my community better. Same thing that astronaut Barrett was saying, you don't have to be the smartest in class. You don't have to come out number one. You can come out number five, it doesn't matter. What defines you is how hard you're working. How hard are you working to contribute to your community? And that's what's going to get you to work for NASA. It's the same thing that I keep on saying. It's not about you going to space. Like he was saying, a lot of things, when it comes to going to the International Space Station, you have to be an American citizen. Are you? And how are you going to be an American citizen? So sometimes it's not about going to space. It's about you could actually help with sending people to space. So don't limit yourself. The moment you say no, I, yes, you want to be an astronaut. Yes, you can be an astronaut, but also think about how can I contribute to my community? So always think like that, because the moment you think about going to space, then you're going to limit yourself. So what do you provide? How is it unique? See, just telling uh, the guys at NASA saying, there are kids that want to hear about space science, they were on board. So people are open to hear your ideas. They just have to be unique. They have to be different and you have to work hard. I'm not an astronaut, but I work hard. I make sure I'm always studying about space science. I'm always keeping in touch with my mentor, who you guys are we're privileged to hear. So there are so many opportunities out there. Don't limit yourself and say, no, I want to be an astronaut. No, think about what's going to help the next person. What's going to help you? So, and what's going to help you? This is what I thought will help you. And of course, hopefully in future, we do more of this. So that's why I can say, um, I'll keep in touch with your teachers uh, to make sure that there are collaborations when it comes to uh, career guidance. Um, and just, not just this, not just, um, not just um, when it comes to uh, um, uh, space science, but also other careers. There are so many careers in this world. And, there's so many ways you can change the world. 
So uh, I guess that's that's it. That's all I can say. Hello. Hello. May I just say something? Yeah. Who's, oh, who's uh, this is uh, this is uh, wisdom, as uh, I earlier stated. Uh, Sorry, there's, wisdom. There's something Sorry. about. Sorry, wisdom. Can you just give me a second? Uh, there's someone from the school that was invited, Jacaranda Combined School, that wants to say something because they are leaving right now. Their driver is waiting for them outside. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, you can be uh, so grateful that. Thank you. We are so grateful that you you had time to house us here. We are so grateful as a school, the young people gathered here. This is just a fraction of our big school. We could have come the whole school. So these were just a few that we handpicked. Um, they obviously love science. So we are just trying to open up their minds and see that science is not only in the classroom, science is actually real and it's out there. It is what it what makes our lives. So we would love that uh, you call us again. You keep in touch. We are just sorry for today. We came uh, 20, 10, 15, 15 minutes, minutes, 15 minutes late. We had some logistical problems. We, we promise we'll be is it in time? Next time. Um, I think one of these students who must be very happy is Andua. He would keep coming, asking about velocity, be, keep asking about the G suit. And hey, I would ask, what's a G suit, you? So he says he, he, he is thinking of some ideas. He's trying to put up some ideas to, to do a Zambian G suit. So please help my boy. He wants to make. Do oh, okay. Yes. So I'm very happy. At least he just tell him he's welcome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm supposed to talk to you after concerning another event. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll come to. This is not the end. The but he must not stop school. Yeah. Yeah. No. Because he's making a G suit. Oh no! Don't don't stop. School. Yeah, make sure you finish school. Remember, it's about hard work and showing that you're different, showing that you are unique. So make sure you finish your school. Yeah, you're not coming out number one at school. That's okay if that's the case. But you have to work hard. And working hard, one of the things that uh, helps people know that you're working hard is you finishing school. Because, of course, it's difficult finishing school. So work hard because that's, of course, a pointer to someone who's accepting you. When they see that you have your grade 12, they see that you have gone to a tertiary institution, then you're telling them that you actually have the will to work hard. But also, what I was saying, make sure you're different, make sure you're unique. Your G suit, make sure it's unique. Make sure it represents where you're coming from. So always remember where you're coming from. I remembered where I was coming from, and that's why I got astronaut Barrett to come here. I met him seven years ago in person. But I said, this is the astronaut that I want to offer the guidance talk. So don't forget where you're coming from. So even as you are designing your G suit, make sure it's representing where you're coming from. And when you represent where you're coming from, when you stay authentic, there are so many doors that open. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you so much. Are we released? Yeah, 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 you are. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. The key. Thank you. It's very new for them. They learned a lot of all that. For me, I'm very old, but still, I learned a lot of those things. This is very new for me.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, keep in touch let's, with yeah, let's keep in touch. Yes, I think whenever you're thinking of those kinds of travel, yeah. we can uh, get, you know, keep you in touch with someone that can, can guide help us you on that case. Yes, At you least so we have this communication oh, with them. Now. But to keep guys more interesting than seeing, seeing is more. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you can almost touch it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so much. All right. Take care.